Stephanie, thank you uh, for inviting me again, for giving me a shorter slot for such an important topic, <laughs> and a little late, and the slot before break. But I will take one minute to congratulate Stephanie and her colleagues for this symposium. And for 10 years of this, and 10 years of advocacy for women's health, particularly as it relates to cardiovascular disease, many people who come to this conference don't realize that this is just one aspect of what she has done. Um, there's public education on the web, there's community outreach programs to help the underserved, particularly women, and then there's issues with advocacy. So 10 years of that, Stephanie, is wonderful. So now I only have, now, now I've got to cut the applause short because I only have 14 minutes, because <laughs> I'm with a break. So I, I do think this is an interesting topic, and as Stephanie was introducing me, um, she said cardiologists enrolled with diabetes treatment, and I've really come to think of this different, right? Cardiologists should be involved with cardiovascular risk reduction, right? And so how you do that, let's call it whatever we want to call it, and you know, there's this debate about diabetes, no diabetes, but I, what I'm gonna try and convince you now is that this is an issue of cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular mortality, and these diabetic drugs are treating cardiovascular disease and not necessarily diabetes. So we'll go from there. So we're in uh, just sort of as an objective, we're really gonna use this to help identify which medications we use to treat our patients who have cardiovascular disease. And this is really based on the data regarding cardiovascular safety and efficacy profile of the agents, as well combining that with the patient's individual cardiovascular history and their comorbid conditions. So I'm gonna center this around a case um, and we'll keep coming back to this. And this is Cynthia. Cynthia is a 56-year-old woman who presents for routine care. She has heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, an EF of 40%, as Jerry said, maybe mid-range, low, right at the top of that, right at the bottom thing. A strong family history of heart disease, but she herself does not have obstructive coronary artery disease. She was cath and had small vessel disease. She's a long -standing, uh, has a long-standing history of type 2 diabetes on the DPP-4 inhibitor to saxagliptin and metformin. The medical history is here on the left, um, as we see multiple comorbidities that we often find, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. And our medications here on the right include lisinopril, carvedilol, metformin 1,000 milligrams twice daily, saxagliptin 2.5 milligrams daily that was recently started, maybe uh, three months ago, venlaxifene, and atorvastatin. When you talk to her, she's not doing well, other than occasionally describing dyspnea on exertion as well as pedal edema. Exam is here, her BMI is 29.9, weight 142, over, uh, blood pressure 142 over 85, heart rate of 62. Exam is really unremarkable. A1C, 7.8%, lipid panel is okay. Uh, her electrolytes are reasonable and her EGFR is 52. So some degree of kidney disease. So the question is, as you're busy in clinic, given Cynthia's existing type two diabetes and a diagnosis of a reduced left ventricular systolic function, what changes would you suggest making to her regimen? One, let her go, doing okay, we'll just go with that. Two, increase saxagliptin to five milligrams daily, a DPP-4 inhibitor. Three, reduce saxagliptin with, or replace saxagliptin with gliburide, a sulfonylurea, replace saxagliptin with an SGLT2 inhibitor, empagliflozin, replace saxagliptin with liraglutide, or add insulin now to her regimen because she has kidney disease. So this is, I, the list can be really long, right? All kinds of medications. So let's go through this just a little bit. Um, I won't spend too much time on this. We know that the prevalence of type 2 diabetes continues to increase. Nearly 30 million Americans have diabetes, of which about 7 million are undiagnosed despite our efforts at increasing awareness and um, uh, to make the diagnosis. And this rate is, is going to increase in conjunction with the rates of obesity as well as the aging nature of our population. We also know that we've made substantial improvements in how we treat diabetes and that um, the burden uh, of cardiovascular disease in general has uh, reduced over the last two decades, but cardiovascular disease still remains the leading cause of death in patients with type 2 diabetes. It increases the risk of stroke, increases the risk of coronary heart disease, rates of heart failure. Uh, Jerry's lecture was wonderful. We know for a long time that diabetes amplifies the risk for heart failure increases the risk of cardiovascular mortality, as well as increasing the risk of total mortality. Simply said, diabetes is associated with reduction in the life of a year's life. When that diagnosis is made, your life is shortened for both men as well as women. 
Now women, the conference is really focused on women. Um, women share, uh, I don't know, disproportionate burden is a special relationship would probably be, and not a good one with diabetes as far as the risk factor that diabetes plays for women. So the prior to menopause, we've learned that general, generally coronary heart disease lags by about 10 years. So there's this protection that women have before they hit menopause. But if you have type two diabetes in a young woman, like we're seeing more and more of, we realize that this protection is lost, that, it be, that it's attenuated. And when we look at studies and we look at relative risk, we see that women indeed, the relative risk associated with diabetes appears to be more powerful in women than in men. Several studies, this is um, from the Rancho Bernardo study where men had a two-fold increased risk for coronary heart disease, while women had a three-and-a-half increased risk for coronary heart disease compared to their non-diabetic counterparts. When women do develop diabetes, when they do develop cardiovascular disease, their outcomes tend to be worse in those with diabetes, diabetic women compared to diabetic men counterparts. Um, MI may occur earlier in women with diabetes than in men, and they, if when they have an MI, the mortality may be higher. Mechanisms behind this are unclear. We're hoping that we're closing treatment gaps that have occurred, the institution of evidence-based medicine, but we still see that there's a residual risk. And then heart failure, it's an important um, complication associated with increased uh, morbidity as well as mortality. And the Framingham Heart Study showed us that the relative risk in, um, associated with diabetes is higher in women compared to men. Now, another thing, and, and busy slide, is just that we don't see diabetes in isolation, right? And particularly when people have cardiovascular disease, we realize that there's this multimorbidity that's associated with diabetes. And this is what this slide is, is, is really trying to show. Here we see these dashed lines, and it has three comorbid conditions, type 2 diabetes, MI, and stroke. And here are, on the bottom line are survival curves, or, or estimated life of years of life lost for diabetes alone, stroke alone, or myocardial infarction. When we can see as these start to add up, you know, as we see our patient Cynthia, that the risk increases, which makes sense. But by age 60, which should be right today, midlife, I guess we'd call it, that it's not midlife for someone who's had a stroke or MI. Their life is shortened substantially. That a history of any of these two conditions is associated with 12 years of reduced life expectancy. A history of all three is associated with 15 years of reduced life expectancy. So let's go back to our case and go to how do we take care of our patient with diabetes. So A1C is important. A1C, we can't ignore. Many of my cardiologists uh, want to say, let's forget about it. But it does. it is important for microvascular disease, retinopathy, nephropathy. And, and so these are the recommended goals that the ADA, as well as the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists propose. And we can see that these goals are individualized depending on comorbid conditions, duration of diabetes, um, how well people are tolerating medications without side effects. But in general, a goal of seven has been recommended. In people with advanced disease, we may be less stringent. But I would imagine that most of us would consider treating Cynthia a little more aggressively at 7.8. She's doing well in general and hasn't had many complications. But we have a lot of choices now, right, of diabetic drugs, tons of choices, DPP-4 inhibitors, sulfonylurea, insulin, the whole work. So, so with so many drugs to choose from, how do we decide? And what I'd like to spend the rest of the talk is really describing the evidence that we've entered a new era of diabetes management, which shows safety and efficacy and cardiovascular impact well beyond and independent, I'm going to say, of lowering A1C. So let's come back to that in a minute. The ADA and the EACD suggest that when we're looking for what medicines we're going to choose in Cynthia, that we consider a variety of factors. Hypoglycemic risk, what is the risk of hypoglycemia? What are the um, implications of an episode in someone who's sick? Need for weight loss, chronic kidney disease, cost effectiveness, what can people afford? And then we have in blue here cardiovascular disease, heart failure, and ASCVD. And really, this portion of heart failure and ASCVD is the decision tree when you're trying to decide now on what agent to treat someone with. Chronic kidney disease, I need to fix my slide, should be on it, uh, but um, should probably come into that group as well. And so previously to 2008, we had very little evidence to help us decide how to treat people. But in 2008, uh, I won't get into too much, the FDA said it's no longer adequate, appropriate to approve drugs just based on glycemic control, that the medicines we're going to use to treat diabetes to lower A1C have to be safe in people who have risk. Just can't be a medicine just to lower A1C. They have to be safe. 
And so they require that all, the, all new agents undergo cardiovascular safety testing in a cardiovascular outcome trial. And so over the last uh, 12 years, we've had nearly 200,000 participants participating in diabetes trials aimed at cardiovascular risk reduction. They are non-inferior studies. Are they safe? And then if they're safe, test for superiority. Nothing to do with A1C efficacy, right? No A1C, no diabetes sort of issue here. These are all cardiovascular outcome trials. And so I'm going to talk about these trials in sort of big sweeps, lots of data. And we'll come back as it helps us treat Cynthia. And I'm going to start with the Incretin mimetics, so the DPP-4 inhibitors and the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and then I'll end with the SGLT-2 inhibitors and sort of sweep it big and try and go quickly. There are four trials with DPP-4 inhibitors. Our patient was on saxagliptin. So is that a good medicine or not? So when we look at the cardiovascular outcome trials that are here, compared to placebo, we can see in the, in the four studies that have been done, each with an individual agent, when we compare it to placebo, it was as good as placebo. So it could lower A1C and it didn't cause harm. So all the studies met primary endpoints showing no increased cardiovascular risk. So another agent we can use to treat people if we need it for glycemic control. But a bit of caution from the studies was that when you looked at the secondary outcomes, so those outcomes are what we call major adverse cardiovascular events, cardiovascular mortality, non-fatal MI, and stroke, pretty much. One of them had a hospitalization for uh, unstable angina. A secondary endpoint at the point, at the time, which was kind of relegated to secondary, uh, um, but become more and more important as we think about it, um, was heart failure. And we saw early on that it, within the DP4 class, there was heterogeneity in heart failure. So the first study that looked at saxagliptin, which Cynthia's on, showed that the rates of heart failure were a little bit higher compared to placebo. The second study with allagliptin and uh, an examine in patients who had an acute coronary syndrome also trended in that direction. So in that setting, the FDA put a warning that on all DPP-4 inhibitors that we have to be cautious and maybe avoided in people who have worsening heart failure, even though that's probably unfair for the last two for citagliptin and linagliptin. So if I made that, I'd if I had any financial stake, I'd probably be mad about that. But that being said, for Cynthia, saxagliptin, probably not the best choice. So probably not the best choice. So let's move forward to the GLP-1 receptor agonists, right? The, um, what do we have from these data? So we have some exciting and promising data, and we'll go over how they fit into the guidelines. There have been six studies published to date about GLP-1 receptor agonists sort of group them with three on the left here, leader with liraglutide, semaglutide sustained six, and dilaglutide rewind, which have all shown benefits for reduction in the MACE cardiovascular outcome. And this is what's shown here. Dilaglutide is a little bit different. This rewind is a um, slightly different study because a lot of patients in this one didn't have established cardiovascular disease. They were just high risk. So I think it was around 60%. In these two, these are people who had most, almost all of them had cardiovascular disease. Liraglutide also had a 22% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, as well as a 15% reduction in all-cause death. Semaglutide, when we looked at their secondary endpoints, what really stood out was some effects it had on stroke for both of these agents. So here are the three that have shown benefit. These three on the right have not um, shown, they have shown that they are non-inferior to placebo in trends that are in the right direction. Not for lixacinotide, but for Excel, there were some trends that went in the right direction for long-acting exenotide or bidurian. And then I'll just point out this last publication that was last year. It was an oral GLP-1 agonist, so it was an oral semaglutide. We know that the rest of them are all injectables. This was an oral pill. And so it compared to placebo in a smaller study, and it was, it was uh, non-inferior to placebo. It missed mis superiority uh, testing, so non-inferior, but what we saw was that there was some interesting findings as far as reduction in cardiovascular death as well as all-cause death, uh, that once you don't meet, and statistically, if you don't meet that first threshold of superiority, the rest of it is just hypothesis generating. The study included a, about 3,300 people, so it was half the size of some of the other ones. So it's still questionable what that means, but again, if, for patients who don't want to take injectables, it may be an option from the GLP-1 receptor agonist. I definitely won't go over this too much, but these are just something to keep in mind when we're dosing these medicines, and all the medicines have to do with the renal dosing 
And GLP-1 receptor agonists, particularly related to liraglutide as well as semaglutide and dilaglutide, can be used in people who have a more advanced kidney disease. So this might be helpful for our patients with advanced CKD where we've been limited in the past. So turning to the SGLT2 inhibitors, right? lots of excitement with the SGLT2 inhibitors and deservedly so. Three studies have been published to date. Uh, one's the EMPA reg outcome study, one's the CANVAS study, and the other's declare TIMI-58. I'll start with the first two because they were more similar. Uh, people who mostly had cardiovascular disease, and we can see that for the primary MACE outcome, there was almost identical reduction in the um, hazard ratio compared to placebo. In empagliflozacin, there was a statistically significant and, and pretty marked reduction in cardiovascular mortality. Trended in the right direction with canvas, but wasn't statistically significant, but again, looking good. And then what was most remarkable was what we found with heart failure hospitalization. Only about 10% of people had heart failure, so this is really prevention of heart failure hospitalization. And so we can see that about, there was about a third reduction in heart failure hospitalization. And Jerry will know, Jerry wrote a paper with me, and I forgot, many years ago, about when we talked about diabetes and heart failure, we always talked about harm, right? We talked about TZDs causing volume retention, or we talked about hypoglycemia. And then all of a sudden, this signal comes up, well, whoa, this isn't harm, right? This is benefit. So it was a really different, I mean, that's really different than what we had talked about 10 years ago when the conferences first started. The, the next study that we have here is DECLARE 58. It's a, a dapagliflozin, and this is a slightly different because what they did was they, rather than use a common endpoint that everyone else did, they split their endpoint into two. They said, we're going to look at heart failure really closely. So we're going to look at both MACE outcome and, and a heart failure, CV death, heart failure hospitalization. And it also included about 60% of people who did not have established cardiovascular disease. So it was looking at the high-risk group but didn't have an event yet. And what they found was that for their MACE, it was not statistically lower, but for the composite of CV death and heart failure hospitalization, there was this effect even in a lower risk population. So lots of, lots of excitement. Coming back to our woman with an EGFR of 52, I think I said, uh, can we use it? The answer is yes, right? But we do have to be aware of renal dosing. There's a slight discrepancy between what the ADA recommends and what the FDA recommends at this point as far as their labeling. I listed the ADA and took out my FDA slide. In general, the ADA is pushing further down the spectrum of advanced chronic kidney disease, particularly because these agents have been renal, shown to have renal protective effects. I didn't show a study called Credence, advanced chronic kidney disease, looking at canagliflozacin, reducing cardiovascular outcomes with an EGFR down to 30, as well as improving renal outcomes. So this is, again, we need to be careful. Uh, well, careful is, I don't know if we need to be careful. So the glycemic effect is much lower. It becomes less effective at lowering A1C down at this lower spectrum, but it doesn't seem to be less effective at reducing cardiovascular disease. This excitement has led to the question earlier, that how are these things working, which could be another good talk, and the answer is we're not 100% certain. But the idea that they can prevent heart failure and can work for prevention. And then in the small subset of the people who have heart failure, could these medicines not be diabetic medicines at all, but could they just be cardiovascular medications with some glycemic effects? Right. And so this has led to this study, this uh, uh, hypothesis, uh, looking at these medications in patients with heart failure in the absence of diabetes. And there are several large outcome studies that are going on. I included a couple of functional studies here. And we're going to get a lot of information, but we were fortunate enough to hear about the first one at the end of last year, and that was called DAPA heart failure, which was a study with dapagliflozin in over 4,000 patients who had heart failure with reduced EF, less than 40, randomized to dapagliflozin versus placebo on good medical therapy. Maybe some of them weren't on Entresto, but it was still good for the time it was started, with a primary outcome again of cardiovascular outcome of hospitalization for heart failure or death from cardiovascular cause, uh, followed for an average of about 18 months. And what was seen was that there was a 26% reduction in the primary outcome, as well as a 17% reduction from death from any cause. 60% of patients in the study did not have diabetes, 40% did, and there was no heterogeneity of effect really across any subgroup there was a, some signal that maybe it was a little bit more beneficial in those who had uh, a lower neurocardic association class compared to a higher one, but this was not statistically significant. 
and I don't think that portrays very well, but these are just the outcomes again, just so you can see the event curves. They begin to split early, quite early in the study. So the benefit was seen at 18 months. And we can see on the upper left, the primary outcome, um, heart failure hospitalization seen here, death from cardiovascular causes with a hazard ratio of 0 0.82, and death from any cause with the hazard ratio of 0 0.83. So a remarkable push forward of taking the medicine from diabetes and moving into the cardiovascular world as far uh, and, um, and seeing benefits that I think will be incorporated into the next algorithm of, of, of our algorithm as Jerry has at Cleveland of how we treat our patients. I was reminded that if my kids saw this slide, they would be mad at me too. <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> they, they would, they'd say, Dad, what, the, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanted to show, these are the 2020 guidelines just published last month uh, at the um, uh, San Jose Care ADA. And I don't want to, we're going to come to this section here on the right, ASCVD, in a better slide. But what it shows is that first-line therapy still is metformin, right? 70% of patients in all these cardiovascular studies were on metformin to begin with. It still remains first-line agent, even though the body of evidence behind it is not super strong, it's still there. The next decision tree here in red is, is indicators of high risk or established ASCVD, chronic kidney disease, or heart failure. If no, then you come here and we go to hypoglycemia, weight loss, cost. If yes, you come to this category, which we'll come to. But what's new in the guidelines and kind of slip through people who don't read them obsessively or <laughs> is that this is consider independently a baseline A1C or individualized A1C target. That is different than any other guideline that had been published before where it was, if needed therapy beyond metformin to get to glycemic control, reach for these agents. This says that we don't care about A1C, right? Just treat. And so this is it, looking at it, metformin and lifestyle. If you have ASCVD risk, a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven benefits, and that means you have to know the slight differences in the study, or an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven benefit if the EGFR is adequate. And then if A1C above the target, we have other options. If heart failure or chronic kidney disease exists, then we should, there's preferential recommendation to an SGLT2 inhibitor as long as the EGFR is acceptable to use it. So that's um, what I wanted to talk about. These are some take home points, just as far as the anti, a reminder that the anti-diabetes agents with proven cardiovascular benefits include the SGLT2 inhibitors, empagliflozin, canagliflozin, and dapagliflozin. So this is what we have so far. There are more coming. The FDA has approved these medications. And you can look for a reduction of cardiovascular events, treat diabetic kidney disease. None of these indications by the FDA have anything to do with A1C. Right? They're cardiovascular indications. And then GLP-1 receptor agonists, liraglutide has an FDA indication for reduction of uh, adverse cardiovascular events in patients with cardiovascular disease. So I want to thank you for your attention and let you get to your break. <laughs>